Smith's, it was originally called Honest Jim, um, Crick took immense exception to this, and he wrote vitriolic letters to everybody he managed to prevent Harvard University Press publishing the book. Um, the first sentence of the book, uh, of course, is, I have never seen Francis Crick in a modest mood. Um, now, that irritated him, but the whole book is actually a peen of praise to, to Francis Crick, and he had nothing to worry about, and he eventually admitted that later on. But for a time, they were not on speaking terms over this. The problem was, he thought that, I mean, that book, I think, is a brilliant book, The Double Helix, because it brings science to life. It shows how it's a real human activity in sure. which um, all sorts of foibles come into play. Uh, Crick didn't like that. He wanted their experience to be seen as, as a serious and, and solid achievement, not as a, something that happened between tennis games. Now, he, he ended up in California eventually and uh, sort of became a very much with the times. He moved along into the 60s. He experimented with himself with drugs. He uh, was an incorrigible flirt. Uh, he sort of he seems in many ways to be somebody who was permanently restless. And do you think that restlessness is part of his, what made him good as a scientist? Yes, I think that's true. He was always open to, to new things. I mean, the reason he took LSD apparently was because he was absolutely fascinated about what it told him about what was going on in, in his brain. And, and he didn't take it very often. He only took it three or four times. But um, uh, um, he, he certainly wanted to, 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 to live life in that sense. And he made this extraordinary decision at the age of 60, which was that having been a geneticist all his life, he was now going to become a neuroscientist. And everyone thought, well, yeah, he'll dabble. He didn't dabble. He started from the bottom like an undergraduate and taught himself neuroscience and then began to write uh, um, books about it and do experiments on it. Um, he never cracked the problem, which he wanted to crack, which is, exactly where in our brain is a conscious thought uh, embodied. But this he spent the, 30 years trying to do it. And he was concerned with, with this part of the brain called the claustrum? Towards, that, yes, towards the very end of his life, he got very interested in, in a sort of small sheet of, of tissue in the brain that connects with a lot of other parts of the brain. It's called the claustrum. Nobody quite knows what it does because nobody's ever met, met a human being in which it's been knocked out by a stroke because it's very difficult to, to knock it out. So, and that's the only way we know about how bits of the brain work. Um, he became convinced that it played an absolutely central role in the claustrum. He was drafting a paper on this a week before he died uh, of cancer, having been very ill for several years. Um, that was how, at the age of 88, that was how passionate he still was to the very end about finding out about what goes on in the world. I mean, this seems to be a somewhat extraordinary by biography or, or profile for a scientist, and particularly the kind who makes major discoveries, which is my sense is that with mathematicians and scientists, quite often what happens is that they're really inventive work is when they're young. Mm. And that much of the rest, of the, when they, in a sense, arrive on the scene and see all that's come before as well as new possibilities fresh mm. all at once. Yeah. And, and that then a lot of the rest of their life is spent elaborating it and training the next generation. Uh, is it unusual to have an, an, you know, you think of writers and composers who have these late life flourishings. Is this unusual? Well, you could argue that it's it's a peculiarly sort of mathematics thing, that what you've just mentioned. In mm -hmm. other words, that the, the brain really does deteriorate in its capacity to do high-end mathematics after the age of, I don't know, 23 or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh, in biology, it probably doesn't matter that much, because biology is not about pure logic. It's about g gathering facts together and seeing the patterns. And so Crick was 50 when, in the crowning triumph of his career, he put together the version of the genetic code that we all now know in 1966. Um, Darwin was 50 in 1959 when he published The Origin of Species. So maybe 50 is the time when biologists peak. Now, you met him. How old was he then? Well, I met I met Crick several times in his he was in his seventies and eighties. Uh, I interviewed him at length in two thousand and three, the the fiftieth anniversary of the double helix discovery, mm -hmm. and I uh, and and it was a fascinating interview. But he was absolutely insistent that there was no point in really interviewing him about events that happened fifty years ago. He couldn't remember what had happened. I should go and look it up. <laughs> and when, now, his what happened with his papers? Did in the end? I mean, he died. He had all of these things. There was a, there was a, there was a kind of up. auction developed over getting hold of his papers. This was before he died, actually, sure. um, uh, between uh, a, a private collector of scientific papers uh, and, in the end, the Wellcome Trust in, in Britain, which is an extremely wealthy medical charity, which was was bullied into, well, it was nudged into bidding for them and and, and paid three million dollars for um, 
uh, his papers, which was a, a you know a, well a huge record for for the papers of a, of a living scientist. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there they are. They're also at the University of California in San uh, in San Diego. Copies of them are there, um, and um, uh, nobody's yet gone through the whole lot it's it, it's everything unfortunately the key years are missing because of an overzealous secretary who threw a lot away when he was moving offices in in the in the 60s so a lot of the correspondence from the key years is missing and has to be pieced together from the other end of the correspondence i.e from watson's uh, archives or, or others uh, this book is uh, your book your biography of francis crick is a, is part of the uh, harper collins eminent live series why Crick and not Watson? Is there a plan to do Watson as well? Well, Watson's still alive. Uh, Crick, Crick died a, a, a few years ago. Um, it, it, it's, it seems a good moment to, to write about uh, Crick. Um, also, uh, Victor McElhenney wrote a biography of Watson just a couple of years ago. And Watson is, of course, his own biographer. He writes, uh, he's written several volumes of his own biography, of which The Double Helix is, is, is one, if you like. Um, but uh, and Watson has a very different career. I mean, much uh, much more prominent in terms of scientific administration and 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 all that, the Human Genome Project, all that kind of thing. Um, but less pure science.